<laughs> All right. Uh, so my scripture reading this morning comes from two places. The first one is the Gospel of John. And this is where Jesus is answering a question from Nicodemus about how in the world can someone be born a second time? He's like, it just blows his mind. How can somebody go back into the womb and be born again? And this is what Jesus says. What is born of the flesh is flesh. And what is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. The second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It's the word of God for the people of God, and thanks be to God. I recently had a session with a psychiatric therapist for routine evaluation, and during her assessment of me, which turned out to be fine, by the way, just so nobody knows, <laughs> she said, Selena, there are three basic things that people avoid. Some people avoid all of them, some avoid only two of them, and some just one. And those three things are anger, hurt, and fear. Then she added, you only avoid one of these three things, and the one that you avoid is fear. Now, I had to ponder that for a while. I left her office and thought about it for a couple of days, and I was thinking, hmm, I'd never really given that any consideration. But eventually, I came to agree with her that, yeah, yeah, I think she's right. I do avoid situations where I might be scared or afraid. I've never had a need for speed. I've never sought out thrill-seeking things like parachuting and bungee jumping and mountain, mountain climbing. I get clammy when I see the free climbers. I can't even watch it. I don't like intentionally fear-inducing haunted houses with those people jumping out with chainsaws and other gruesome, frightening things. I don't like horror movies of the same ilk. And while I don't like making someone angry, and I don't like to get angry, and I don't like to hurt somebody, and I don't like being hurt, I don't avoid those situations if I feel that that's the right thing to do. Now, an interesting thing of my avoidance of fearful situations means that I don't experience fear in a direct fashion very, very often. However, for many years, I was quite the slave to fear, as that verse mentioned. And the two strongest fear bonds for slavery for me were anxiety and worry. This ongoing nebulous fear that something, something bad could or would happen. And I would seek out my nightmares, those worst case scenarios, and that it would chase them down so that I could evaluate them and inspect them and worry all day about how to avoid them. Now over the years, God has since changed quite a lot in me. And now my faith is so strong, it far exceeds my anxieties. And so this morning, I wanna share some of the ways that I began to stop chasing my nightmares. And with the Holy Spirit's help, how I began to unshackle myself from a nearly constant state of worry. So first, let me open with prayer. God in heaven, I'm about to speak on things that are in people's dark closets of their hearts. I ask that you be very careful or help me to be very careful with my words, that my words might be a Christ light that gently opens those doors and shows the people where their fears are and might be, and that you might hold open arms to embrace and hug those people, whether they're able to come out of that closet or they're not. I ask that grace upon me this morning, and I grasp that your love would linger long after the service. Amen. I think we all recognize that fear does have a healthy place in our wide range of emotions. It protects us from dangerous situations. It changes our metabolism and that inner chemical mix in order to help us run away if we need to run away to safety or defend ourselves if we have to get into a fight to survive. And in more primitive times, fear would pop in, it would do its thing. And as soon as that scary situation had passed, it left 
and our bodies return to their regularly scheduled programming. <clears throat> fear is a great buddy when the chips are down. However, fear is not a very good roommate because it's gonna keep you up all night wondering aloud, what if, what if that, what if this, what if that? And as we humans evolved our social structures and technology, a lot more potential threats have been created. Instead of hunting and gathering for our daily sustenance, our finances are now what we use for our essential needs. So the potential lack or loss of income can create a huge amount of anxiety. We live in a much closer proximity with each other so that problems with neighbors and our governments and the authorities are always present. Now, this doesn't even begin to touch the bombardment of scary news stories that reinforce that we aren't safe and advertising that continually reinforces that we aren't good enough unless we buy their product. And this is, of course, a big reason why I got rid of my television when I began living alone. Our bodies, however, respond to peace and fear very physically in a way that I would use as an analogy like your pet cat or dog. When your pet cat or dog is at home, so oftentimes you'll see they'll roll over in the back and they'll nod off and they'll go to sleep. This is because they feel so safe in your home that they're completely rack, relaxed enough to do that. They have no fear of harm. They have no fear of lack. They just roll back and sleep. Now, conversely, for most of us anyway, if you have to take your pet to the vet's office, <laughs> I'm thinking of Jillian right now, but if you have to take your pet to the vet's office, the chances are good that they're not gonna be sleeping on their back in the waiting room. Your pet smells and hears all kinds of things that tell them, don't go there, it's a scary place, it's a scary place, don't go there, and they start trembling. And our world, our modern world has become for many people how these fearful pets might feel if say you had to take them to the veterinarian's office during a thunderstorm. Instead of our being our buddy in crisis, Fear becomes that roommate that is constantly looking for that next threat, a misspoken word, a badly written email, a check engine light, an ache or a pain that wasn't there before, and our minds begin to race down a path of catastrophe, trying to find the biggest, scariest nightmare and a dozen ways to avoid it. We're stressed, we're anxious, we're afraid and we become bound by a spirit of slavery that makes us fall into a constant state of nebulous fear, that very thing Christ would have us be freed from. So here's a scripture passage that's probably familiar to most of you. Behold the lilies of the field, they do not sow nor do they reap. And yet I tell you this, even King Solomon in all of his glory was not adorned as beautifully as they. Don't worry about what to eat, don't worry about what to wear. Don't worry about where you'll sleep. Your father in heaven knows all of your needs. He knows all of your needs. And you are more precious to him than even these beautiful flowers that are here today and wither away in the heat tomorrow. Worry only about the things of today. That's a paraphrase of Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And it's frankly the first thing I ever highlighted in my Bible after I became a Christian. That passage would become a cornerstone in the firm foundation of Christ that is now my spiritual life, my resurrected life, my born again in spirit life. And so how did the Holy Spirit help me become light enough that I can now trust that she's gonna blow me from here to there without knowing exactly where she's gonna take me? So there are three things I'd like to, that I'd like to propose to you that worked for me. The first one is to embrace your spiritual identity. The second one, in, is to treat your body as precious, like that of having an adopted child. And the third, stop chasing your nightmares. So let's talk about the first one, embrace your spiritual identity. Decades before I even understood my gender identity and began to come to terms with that huge thing, God began to reveal to me that my core essence, that spiritual essence of who I am is eternal. It is eternal, it is redeemed, it is powerful and it is beautiful. I was given a hint of what my spirit clothed in Christ looks like. 
A term some psychologists use for this positive self-perception is my best possible self, my best possible self. On a purely psychological level, our best possible self is that person who we believe we could be and would be if everything in our lives was as good as it could be. It's an exercise of changing the picture of our mental selves from victims to victors, from Debbie Downer to divine diva, from worthless to wonderful. Our brains become conditioned to the mental state of mind we keep it in. If we constantly pursue negative self-talk and dwell in anxiety, that becomes the literal chemical norm for our brain. And when that happens and something good comes our way or somebody gives us a compliment, we default to thinking that that is some sort of aberration or that it is untrue. <clears throat> Christ has given us a resurrected body and mind. We don't have to wait until we are dead to live, begin living a resurrected life. It starts with being able to look in the mirror and say, I love you. It continues by shushing the negative self-talk of I'm stupid, I'm ugly, I'm not smart enough, I'm not brave enough, I'm not whatever, enough. I'm here to tell you this, you are enough. You are enough. You are enough because Christ makes you enough. No matter what your failings, no matter what your flaws, no what, and what mistakes you make or do make or will make, Christ fills those gaps to make you like him, created in the likeness and image of God. And to back me up on that, here's a couple of passages for you to ponder. I'm sure some of you know them. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Hear that again, renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Book of Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24. Also, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too, you and me, we too might walk in newness of life. Behold, old things are passed away, I make all things new. That's Romans 6, 4 with just a dash of revelation mixed in. So here's some exercises I would offer that you can think about. And I mentioned one before, you've heard me say it at other times that I do this. Whenever you look in the mirror, say, I love you. And anytime negative self-talk starts to berate you or others demean you, you say in your mind, I am enough. I am enough because Christ is more than enough. I am enough because Christ is more than enough. And if you really wanna take the deep dive into renewing your mind, begin to picture who you are as your best possible self, or as the ancient Greeks put it, know thyself. So the next thing I want to talk about is treating our body as precious, like it was a child you adopted. When we live a resurrected life, we become aware that our spirit, while within our body, is not confined to it. And we so often spend our lives treating ourselves like body and spirit or some sort of package deal. And atheists would agree completely with that. However, to be born of the spirit means that we begin to look at our spirit as something more than our body something apart from it, something eternal, something holy. Now religions and churches and spiritual organizations spend huge amounts of time talking about how to improve our spiritual selves. Look at the, self, look at the books, shelves, or Google, Amazon, or whoever, but you'll see all that. And I don't think, however, that there's nearly enough time spent helping us to begin how to reframe how to treat our physical selves our bodies. A big part of countering stress and fear is helping our body to be as healthy as it can be, to change that default chemical mix in our heads to be in a healthy state all the time, unless there's a real fear thing. Not in a fear state all the time until there's this good thing. 
In my personal case, I began changing my diet from a lot of processed and fried and preserved foods to more produce and fresh foods. Not 100% vegan, not vegetarian, not paleo. I still love my fried chicken. I love my cheesecake and some other things that are probably not good, but I'm much more careful to put food into my body that keeps it healthy. And all of my inner chemistry, head and body, well balanced. I also like to do some exercising and I do the stuff that I can do, not the stuff everybody thinks you can do and as much as possible stuff that I like to do. A lot of you know that I love to bike. I love to bike when the weather's nice and walking. I like to walk and hike and I do gentle physical meditation exercises throughout the week. So in other words, I began to look at my body as a child that God gave to me for adoption. I want to care for her. I want to love her. I want to keep her, this body, as safe and healthy as possible. This body is like a foster kid that I've rescued. Now, this framework that I'm sharing with you reminds me of the many pets that I've had over the years, and nearly all of them, dogs, cats, birds, hedgehogs, and a rabbit that followed me home one day, literally a white rabbit, Alice in Wonderland type thing, have been rescues of some sort or another. I discovered that once they have a stable home environment and they're fed good food and they're properly groomed, they begin to thrive. And the same thing is true with humans. Children crave being loved. They crave good routines. They crave being kept in good health, even if they don't always know how to express that. Why would we not want to do anything less with this body that God gave us? And so here's another verse for you. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, within you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own? For you've been bought with for with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, that verse comes far in a passage regarding immorality, so it tends to be swung around like a big bludgeon from the pulpits. But I do like the core idea. Our body is a residence, a residence for God the Father, for Christ the Son, and for the Holy Spirit. And I think that alone makes it precious enough to take care of. And so my last point is stop chasing your nightmares. Stop chasing your nightmares. When I was a kid and a teen, I worried about everything. I can't recall how many times I heard my mom say, stop being a worry wart. But worry and anxiety were my defining characteristics. And I can imagine that I'm probably not the only one in the world like this. I know many people that I've met and work with that live in this constant state of fretting and fear. And humans have a tendency to seek out that worst case scenario, the nightmare. Like so many things in life, it's not a bad thing to do when in the right context. And that, like there's that old adage, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. That is just wisdom. It's why we have savings accounts, and it's why we go crazy and put a week's worth of underwear for an overnight trip in our suitcase. The problems arise when we begin to magnify every little worry into the nightmare scenario. You're running late for work, I'm gonna get fired. You have a new pain and you Google it, I'm terminal. You add something in a dish for a dinner you're making and you forget to add like the right spice, I'm a horrible cook. You have this little zit on your face, everyone is staring at Puss Mountain. Stop it. We need to stop it. And we need to ask ourselves, what was I worried about last week or last month or last year? There may have been one or two items that actually needed that kind of concern, but I'd be willing to bet that almost none of those things eventually evolved into the nightmare, worst case scenario we thought might happen. Another variation of that same thing is ask yourself that thing you're worrying about, am I gonna even remember this next week or next month? or next year. And if the chances are pretty good that it's not, you need to kind of close that door on the nightmare. Now over the years I've grown a lot in faith. I'd even say faith is one of my strongest spiritual gifts, but that came with a lot of time and a lot of practice. One of the things I would do, and I still do, is I think about the most likely scenario versus the worst case scenario. And another thing I began to do was cutting back on the things that were inputting nightmare scenarios into my head. And for me, it was often the news and having gloom and doom people surrounding me all the time. Just like nourishing our bodies, our minds also need to be fed good words. 
they need to be fed good words. They need to be fed encouragement to operate well. And once I started reading more educational and pleasantly entertaining things, and I started to surround myself with kinder people, a lot of my stress disappeared. That gentle reprogramming of my mind, the renewing of my mind, as Paul put it, made a huge difference. It focuses me on the today concerns, and it allows me to be more sensitive to how the spirit is breezing through my life, sending me here and there, by my going off and hunting down the darkest nightmare scenario and wondering where it's lurking and figuring out ways that I could fight it off in case it comes out of that cave. So as a quick review, embrace your spiritual identity, that resurrected itself of who you are. Say, I love you. Take care of your body like it is an adopted child or a temple of God. Stop chasing your nightmares. These are the concepts that have helped me and I hope you might find some value in them too. And I wanna close with one final verse. This one's from Jeremiah chapter one. It's when God was first calling Jeremiah as a young boy to be a prophet to the nations. And young Jeremiah couldn't fathom being nearly good enough for such a thing. He was just a boy. Well, you know, God, what are you talking about? But God told him this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Your role in life may not be a prophet to the nations, but you are an adopted, reborn child of God. You are set apart for a unique purpose. You are known, you are seen, you are loved, and guess what? You are all of that long before you were even born. Amen. Amen, amen. We have a God who meets us in the fear. A God who meets us in that fear. Thank you, Selena. Jaxi, I see this message is already bubbling over in you. Let's pass oh, it. it is, it is, it is. Well, Selena has such a way with words. I just love to hear you talk. You just, I wanted to say two things. Uh, I'll, say th I'll say this first. Uh, the fear, we have fear. We shouldn't feel guilty about it. It's one of those things that's le left over from, from, centuries from eons ago when we were cave people and we had fight fright or free or freeze and then at that point it was a very useful thing to be fearful because people killed each other all the time and so you had to you had to be on guard mm -hmm. and unfortunately we still carry that within us but also fortunately we have we have the spiritual uh, nurturing that can help us overcome that. The other thing is that you have changed yourself spiritually, but also physically, because the brain. <laughs> the, <laughs> no, well, <laughs> well, well just... I'm talking about your brain. The brain <laughs> we we now know has the ability to it's has plasticity and it's and there are grooves in it that we can actually change and so yeah. some of it's from our parents who said don't don't be conceited don't be this don't be that and yeah. and we we have those grooves in our mind but if you look in the mirror and you say i love you or you're pretty or you look good today that actually makes a new groove into your brain and that's what you're doing discussing has happened to you along with the spiritual change you've actually changed the grooves in your you, the neural pathways in your brain that now make you more uh, uh optimistic it's it's a physical change too it's a, it's a uh, a gift that we have that we we need to to nurture thank you yeah. Yeah, you expanded exactly on the things I was trying to hit on. I got new grooves. Yeah, <laughs> grooving, girl. Amen. Uh, let's go, Peter, and then Judy. Um, thank you very, very much, Selena, for a wonderful message. Um, I was thinking all the time you were talking 
about a book that Howard Thurman, Howard Thurman is a very acclaimed uh, African-American theologian and philosopher uh, who was for a long, long time uh, pretty much ignored uh, by the academy. But he, um, he's coming back now into full visibility. Um, his books are being read and uh, he was for many years the chaplain, the first African-American chaplain at Boston University School of Theology. And he founded, that's right, Brent, <laughs> and he founded the uh, Church of All Nations uh, in San Francisco uh, in the 1940s. But he wrote a book called Jesus and the Disinherited. And uh, one chapter was on fear. And then he has uh, sort of one word for every chapter pretty much. That, but the fear one is very, very significant uh, for him and for uh, the human condition. And, uh, and one of the things that I was impressed by with you and with him is the, the continuity that exists between uh, the, the resurrected life and the life of, of the Christian who is following Christ. And that these are in continuity. It's not that one succeeds the other, uh, comes after right. the other, but rather we can begin uh, the resurrected life now. And, uh, and uh, if we do the right things in following uh, Christ, uh, our, our leader and guide. And, uh, and so you had that theme going uh, very nicely, I thought, and very much in tune uh, with, with Howard Thurman. And, uh, and uh, that book that he wrote and published in the 1940s uh, has never really been out of print. Uh, and it still is selling thousands of copies uh, um, uh, every year uh, now. And uh, so it's, um, it's thank you very much for reminding me of that and for bringing your message into alignment with Howard Thurman and in alignment, I think, with the, with, with the, the, the wisdom of God. Well, thank you for touching me with a great theologian in the same sentence. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, Peter. Let's go to Judy. Oh, well, Selena, you had so many things today that I could relate to that, that just uh, all through my life, I kept thinking about those different passages that you, you talked about, not worrying about what you wear. And, and uh, But the one thing that struck me the most was that Christ is more than enough. Yes. And, and sometimes I think I'm not enough. Uh, and, and I don't, I have trouble looking in a mirror and saying that I am okay. Right. And right. so I know that. And, but my faith tells me that when I don't think I'm enough, I know that Christ is more than enough. And I just keep relying on him uh, and, yeah. and just trying to do it one day mm -hmm. at a time is is all i can think about and i and a long time ago i realized that if i worry about what's going to happen tomorrow i'm wasting a whole day of my life and i and i don't want to waste days yeah. of my life so thank you selena for so many things today yeah that's a lot of wisdom in there too thank you judy thank you judy jillian i saw you unmuted i'm not sure if that was an accident do you have something to <laughs> share hard to say with her at work um that was definitely an accident <laughs> um sorry you're in my pocket <laughs> we've got the uh the fearful dogs there right yes yes sorry about that it's all good, oh, that's all, good. <laughs> all right who'd like to go next heather Selena, I wish I could give you a big hug right now. That was so awesome. That that I took a lot of notes. <laughs> um, I think I might have said this before, but the whole message of adoption and how we're cared for. Um, so my youngest son is 16, and we um, adopted him when he was born. And I had heard that message at church around that same time, and I was so struck by even though I had two biologic kids that, of course, I love. Yeah, of course. Heart, 
of course. I felt both more love and more responsibility to the one that was adopted. Yeah, um, I, I, I can relate. Yeah, and it, I mean that, but that just the, the value God's, God's responsibility to us and our responsibility to ourselves, because, you know, we, we owe that to him. Right. Yeah. So. And a little to ourselves. I, it's, I, it's too long to talk about here, but the, the difference between loving that which was born from you and choosing to love somebody that needs that love is vast. Um, in neither case, we may always be the perfect parent, but, but there's a difference between what, what God gave you as a gift and what you chose as a gift from God. So yeah, it's powerful. Thank you. What a Barbara. I just real quickly want to relate to that in my teaching. Um, I feel such a responsibility to my students with how I relate to them and the love I try to show to them um, because so many of them come from broken homes and I have to right. give to them all the love that I have in the short time that I have with them and the years that I have with them. So I feel such a huge responsibility to them that, um, yeah, that I can't show them with, you know, between the church versus state, you know, in, in school, but still through my heart, um, I can only show them so much, but I feel it just the same. So thank you, Selena. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're touching on, even though I have a great faith, I don't, I don't do well with love. And you, you read the love chapter in Corinthians, and you know what that's all about. Uh, but there are some changes that have been happening in my life about learning to love. And I mean, it's like that, where you have other people that God puts in your life that you, you learn to love like God loves them. I you, feel like they're my adopted children. Yes. Why right, I have them. right. Yes. That's what I'm getting at. That's why I yes. use that analogy. And that's why Heather's so powerful on saying that, too. Yes. And, but yes, thank you. Are there any others? If not, uh, thank you for this message, which is live in, in this group. Thank you, Selena, for bringing it to us. And I invite you now, as we prepare for communion, to grab something to eat and something to drink and sing along to this song, I Thank God, this new song. January 23rd, 2021.